freeze that orange. Order arms. Changed over the years, 
The fire department has always been and will always be about service to others. <clears throat> I can only imagine the stress, anxiety, and the level of responsibility the class of 61 felt undertaking this commitment to serve. They not only assume the role of a firefighter, which is stressful enough within itself, but they also assume the role of a pioneer, trailblazer, role model, and hero for every African American citizen in the city of Greensboro. We all script a little bit. I don't know if um, Mr. Otisellas is in the audience or not. But uh, I need to tell a story about him. Um, coming out of training and going to my first assignment, I treated pretty nicely. You know, all the guys, you know, we all got along pretty well, which was good. And I got transferred to Station 1. And it was my first opportunity to work with the African American Empire Department. And Otis basically took the um, role of my father, because he was the only person in the world that talked to me that way. <laughs> but the things that he said were just so insightful. He really helped me. He taught me some valuable lessons. And I really appreciate that. And for all the gentlemen here, we just sincerely appreciate the sacrifices you made. And one other thing I want to say, I am a diehard Michael Jordan fan. And for the past year, several years, I've had a Michael Jordan um, picture on the desktop. You know, taking that last shot in the Georgetown. And as I was looking through some things last night, and I pulled up a picture of this group, and I would ask you to, if you take your program, and look at that bunch standing in front of Station 4, and depending on your age group, I don't know if you want to call them smooth, um, <laughs> the bomb, whatever you want to call them. That is a fine, fine group of young men. In the moment, I removed Michael Jordan from a computer desktop. <laughs> so I want you guys to know that every day, I and I'm sure several other people will be thinking about it. Because every time I file on a computer, your picture will be there. I will leave it there to return to. Uh, one last thing. I believe the class of 1961 clearly exemplifies the quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson. It reads, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Thank you, gentlemen, for your courage, your determination, and your leadership. And I'd like to ask Chief Flowers to come forward. Thank you, Chief Honor. I'd like to begin by giving honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to uh, Thank especially the Chief of the Greensboro Fire Department, Chief Grayson, and Chief Hunter for uh, introducing me today. Also, I would like to recognize the, uh, the members of the Class of 61 uh, before we go into any comments. I would like to ask them if they would please stand, and uh, I would like for them to introduce themselves and share with us uh, people that they invite to come to be with them today. Yeah, forgive the old man. <laughs> my name is Percy Bigelow, and I have accompanied me today my daughter, Patricia Gay Bigelow, do you stand? And my son, Edward Bigelow.
My name is Frank Fortune. Accompanying me is my wife, Trisha. My daughter, Janae. McKnight, from Manhattan, Virginia. My son, Terry Fortune. From Lano, Maryland. My grandson, Judy. My six foot granddaughter. <laughs> Morgan. <coughs> and a great group that I perform with occasionally. The run of the last thing is the Please do. 
I'm sure my brother's here. He's firefighter, Greensboro City, my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure who else is here, but uh, we are his family. Thank you. Just recently retired, 30 years of service, past December. Uh, the Carmen family just want to say thank you for this occasion to recognize the class of 1961. Thank you so much. Now, this young man standing on the side here looks just like Gene Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gene was not a part of the original group, so he was close, so we like to recognize him. We appreciate you being here. I'm here, I'm Ronald Coleman. This is my brother Steve, who's taking pictures as well. Uh, my father came into the class, he had a blood pressure problem. Gives me great respect. I tried to uh, get this program, I went around and talked to some people. And I'm really glad to see that they have taken time to recognize these people. Thank you. Thank you. Jumping, I think, from the second story window 
come to a life net. Well, now, uh, jumping, that wasn't that bad for me. I, I mean, I could do that. It was just a matter of getting out in the air and you had to come down. <laughs> but we had members of our class that would get into that window and they would go through the motion of jumping. <laughs> and I think some of my members, class members, still said they never come out. They still in the window. <laughs> But the most exciting thing that happened to me in my time was the Palm Pier Lab. I don't think I'll ever forget that. And I was happy when I heard that they had changed that. Because it really didn't give you confidence. It frightened you to death <laughs> to me. But you know, uh, we had uh, the very first training class that was organized for a complete training program before being uh, uh, before being stationed at a station. Uh, our training was the best that it could be. And uh, we, uh, we felt that uh, when we left training, that we were ready and prepared to face the world. But it was God's grace that sustained us through all of that. And it was His grace that carried us through many situations that we had to uh, deal with in that time. Uh, there were many times in my career that I had to call on the name of the Lord just to get through the problem situations that we encountered. Because you see, in 1961, Greensboro, the city of Greensboro Fire Department and the city of Greensboro was still segregated. Now, you, a lot of you don't even understand what that's all about. Uh, but being a segregated environment caused things to be much different. We were assigned to Station 4 uh, as a unit uh, when we completed our training. And uh, we did not have captains at Station 4 to manage our ships. We had four men that was appointed as leaders that led their companies. We had uh, two, state, uh, two, two, uh, two companies, an uh, engine company and a pump company on duty every day, a ship, and the same for big ship. And one leader uh, led that group, uh, the group of uh, the pumper, and one was on the ladder truck company. Uh, we were unable to go through a testing process to become captains at that time because the <coughs> rules of the fire department said you had to be a part of the organization 10 years before you could take the test for captain. So we had to be leaders. Uh, they had to have leaders in our station to lead us. And uh, believe it or not, that process worked well. We worked through some very difficult situations, but we all worked together to help each other and to make this particular situation work. Now, it was no cakewalk. I use that pretty often to let people know that things didn't happen magically. You really had to work to get through the situations. During my life as a firefighter, especially early in our careers, we saw some very difficult times. We went through very difficult times. I'm sure that those of you that's on this front row here, along with myself, remember the, uh, the demonstrations in the downtown area. Uh, we would look at TV and oftentimes we would see family, friends, acquaintances being rudely treated. And oftentimes, it was by some of the members of the organization of the Greensboro Fire Department. That was tough to take. And there were times when the call would come that would threaten to send us into that environment to assist. But we were never, ever sent. Again, that was God's grace. <laughs> Each member of this class can tell you stories on top of stories dealing with the things that we went through as members of 
Station 4. But in the 1967, uh, I think it was early in the year, I can't remember the exact time, integration came within the Greensboro Fire Department. Now, integration came as a request of the line firefighters themselves coming together to vote for integration. Now, I'm sure, in my own opinion, that White firefighters and black firefighters had different uh, goals for uh, the integration at that point. Now, if you just think about it, there were four captain positions at state, Station 4, and uh, they would be immediately promoted into for integration. But my thoughts were that because of integration, it would allow the black firefighters a greater opportunity for progression within the Greensboro Fire Department. You did not have to compete for positions at one station. You could compete for positions throughout the organization. Following integration, the first member that was elevated to a higher position and it was, I guess, around 67, 68, was Howard Drake. Howard Drake was elevated to fire prevention inspector status. He soon left the department to pursue another career. Then Howard Coble followed Drake into the fire prevention area, and he became a fire prevention inspector. We were able to take the test when it was close to our 10 years, finally, the opportunity. And then they dropped the 10-year period to eight years. <laughs> well, that allowed many more people to sit down to take the test. I would assume that there was 200 to 250 people, I'm guessing 200 at least, that were taking the test for captain. It made it very difficult. And, uh, you know, when you are a member of an organization like the fire department, everybody is looking at the same material. You have to study the same stuff. And I always try to figure, there's got to be an angle. You need to do something to prepare yourself to even be greater than that. So uh, I began to look at that and think about that and dwell on that. And behold, after the first test was taken, the first person that was promoted to captain was Howard Snipes. Howard was promoted and then followed Howard was Daniel Banks. And they remembered me as the third person to be uh, promoted to captain and Robert Carmen followed me. Carmen went into training. I'll share with you today of the five original people that was promoted in the early years. One member was not a part of class of 61. The others came out of that class. Through the 1970s and the 1980s, educational opportunities, uh, working in special assignments, and being able to work through promotional processes gave some of us some advantages. I took the advantage of some of those situations and was able to be promoted up the chain of the organization. Upon completing a 5 chiefs promotional process in early 1993, I was appointed to the fire chief position by city manager Bill Kostoff. Again, God showed his grace. I look at that as an opportunity because it could have been anyone from that class. The class of 61, primarily, most of them had complete educational backgrounds. Many of them had more than just a four-year degree. Many of them had even more. And, uh, I did not have as much education as a lot of the 
Now the members did, but I did pursue the process. Now, being fire chief was important to me. And I think about it in these terms. Having the opportunity to move from segregation from uh, uh, segregation to integration from the back of the truck to the highest office in the department was important to me. That was very important to me. It gave me the opportunity to, to lead in our organization, to inspire members of our organization, to motivate and to encourage members of the Greensboro Fire Service to move toward a goal that we could establish as a team. I realized that I had the best of many worlds from which to choose a leadership style. My beginning at Station 4 had a strong influence on my career. There I saw young men, some of them with great integrity, honesty, willing to work together using a team approach to solve problems. I also worked in many positions throughout the department with great leaders. But the leaders of Station 4 framed a concept for me to find a way to give others a chance to contribute would ultimately make the organization successful. There were many men of great influence in my life. I always use this metaphor because the first was my father. Now, when I was young, I did not always think that taught me best. And oftentimes, when he was telling me, it did not make sense to me. But in my later years, some of the words that he would use was, son, always do your best. Always be prepared to accept something better, but always work to make this one the best that you can. In my fire service career, I heard another gentleman speak many occasions. And I think the thing that stood out in my mind most was Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream. It was those two gentlemen, my father, my dear, and Dr. King, that helped me to craft the dream of moving to the highest level that I could in the fire service organization. I thank God that I realized my dream here on earth to be fire chief. In closing, I would say the class of 61 would like to challenge the Greensboro Fire Service. When we became members of the organization, we left this organization better than it was when we came. Our challenge to you today is to leave this organization better than it was when you became a part of the organization. You know, a man that spoke during my time that I can always remember his words ringing in my ears. I recall him saying, and it was the coach of uh, North Carolina State Basketball Program, Jim Valvano, and he said in his comments, and I think at this time he told the world that he had cancer all over his body. He said, always do your best, don't give up. Put your dream together, put it on paper. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. I would say to you today, if you do the best that you can do, the Greensboro Fire Service will always give you more than you can receive. God bless you today. 
We appreciate you recognizing the class of 1961 and making us feel that we've done something important when the only thing we did was come to work and do what we needed to do to help Greensboro citizens continue to receive the excellent service that we know that they are so deserving. Before we honor and recognize the class of 1961, first of all, I'm going to also I had the opportunity to work with many members of the class of 1961. Charlie Thompson, Frank Fortune out of Station 11, my dear friend Dan Banks, and mentor, and my roadie, Crawford Jones. <laughs> Crawford, thank you very much. I thank all of you for allowing me to stand on your show, for allowing all of us to stand on your show. Although I'm unfortunate that I have a father with me, I have many fathers. Crawford guided me, helped me bring my little temper down that I had, saying you're not going to talk to me like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I always give you words of encouragement, and I appreciate you, and I appreciate all of you. The Chief mentioned the first um, African American captain. He is here today in the audience, so I'd like to recognize him. I was not. He just walked out. Okay, but I want to recognize him while he's here. We're going to call out the members of the class. Most of the ones that are here can come up and receive the flag that we have here. We'll come down, come down there. And the family members of the deceased will come up and get the flag. We'll certainly appreciate it.
Robert and Carmen Cassini.
Ernest McCoy.
Uh, before we start it, I wanted to recognize Howard Slight, Captain Howard Slight. Would you please stand so everybody can recognize you for the first time? <laughs> He's the closest thing probably to a brother that I have without being blood related. <laughs> and uh, the opportunity, I have been on this department 31 years and have worked around Chief Gerald but never worked with him. And now we're at the training center together. And I'll tell you, he's one of the finest people I have ever worked with. Yeah. Not only does he serve us well here, but he also serves as well as a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army Reserve. <laughs> when I got up this morning and looked in the mirror, I asked myself what happened to that young, skinny guy that had hair? What happened to him? 31 years changes a lot of things. 50 years changes even more. But the one thing that time cannot change, it cannot erase the courage it took for you to face the adversity that you faced and overcome it. Because you cannot measure a man's character on the mountaintop. You can only measure it in the valley of adversity. Gentlemen, you have a lot of courage. Time cannot erase the doors you helped open for so many. And all you gotta do is look around. And you helped open the doors for many, many people. 
not just African Americans, but females, Hispanics, Asians, a lot of people. And we thank you for that. And it cannot uh, erase the difference you made to so many. I get to tell him he's wrong today. Because he don't have any power over me anymore. <laughs> Did your job. Chief, I'm sorry, I have to differ. I work with many of these men, and they just didn't come to work. I think the Otis Sellers and George White at Station One. That's, that's who I met first. That's where my assignment was. Always had a kind word to say to everybody. And George always had a little skip uh, in, in his walk. That's probably the reason he went out on a bad knee. <laughs> he always had a skip in his walk. And Otis always positive. Now, I don't know what Otis said to him, but he was always positive with me. <laughs> I think back about Chief Carmen. He was my battalion chief. What a joy to work with. Never had a harsh word or bad thing to say about anyone. He was always positive, always enthusiastic, and always encouraged you. Riding calls with, with, with Frank and Crawford, always tried to be on me and wherever we was riding to. But see, it's a big deal here whether you know it or not. Uh, we like to race, I mean, we, we like to go. <laughs> is here today. He wasn't a member of the 61st class, but uh, where is uh, Mr. O.C. Johnson? Oh, there he is. He was real, real bad about checking 1023. That means you're on the scene first. And we would arrive and engine four would have already said, we're 1023, but four is nowhere in sight. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to be in the area. <laughs> Although he said he was always first, that didn't always happen. <laughs> when I got promoted to captain, my driver was Eddie Cole. The man could drive a fire truck. And when you were driving the old snorkel, it was so old, we called it the pterodactyl. <laughs> if anybody could drive it, any could. And operating that thing was awful. When you got in it, you did a lot of bouncing. And when you're 80 feet up in the air, that's not a really good feeling. <laughs> but Andy could operate that thing where it was smooth as it could be. And I remember him so dearly. Chief Flowers promoted me to battalion chief. Boy, was that a gamble. <laughs> but I thank you for the opportunity, and I thank you for the confidence you had in us. So I'm just one, just one person that these men had a major impact on. Thanks for being difference makers and for changing the Greensboro Fire Department forever. Uh, in the military, a hand salute is used as a sign of respect. It is rendered by someone who is showing respect to others who have earned it. So as I close today with a salute to you, the members of the 1961 recruit class of Greensboro Fire Department, you have earned it. All right. concludes our program for today. Thank you.